Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange thing, this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? Lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or maybe sometimes background noise or company. As far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The main idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties, to help you to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep. But maybe you need something a bit different. Maybe you just need some background noise. Some people like and white noise generators, or the sound of the ocean, or the wind in the trees, or the waves on the shore, or some boring dude just droning on in the background. What counts as you're listening, though, is that you don't try to force the sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story, and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now, obviously, I'm hoping you're asleep before we get to the end of the episode but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night with us, this actually probably won't work for you. It'll probably take a solid three nights or so for you to get used to it, to get used to my voice, maybe my accent is strange, maybe the idea of listening to someone talk to you while you're asleep is a bit odd, or maybe one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe you don't actually struggle to go to sleep. Maybe you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend in that case is to let the podcast run all night. Download a bunch of episodes, put them in a playlist, and let them go. That way, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can just uh, carry on listening and go back to sleep again. And you can even do the same thing if you wake up before your alarm. Some people wake up 30 minutes or 60 minutes before their alarm and they really struggle. And you can carry on listening and go back to sleep again. And you may wonder what the point of that is. But I've had people actually thank me for suggesting this because there is something about allowing yourself complete relaxation right before the alarm that's satisfying on a whole new level. So listen and try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may seem strange to you. So give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to ask for a couple of minutes of your time. If you are enjoying CP Time Tales, if it's helping you to get a good night's sleep and helping you take control of your life, and you would like to help support the show, and importantly, if you have the means to help support the show, please consider signing up on Patreon. I'm not sure if the show is ever really going to be advertisable, 
I've tried to run it a few times and the response isn't great, which I suppose isn't surprising because most of the people listen to the show fall asleep pretty quickly. So um, we don't really give great support to advertisers. So the only way I can really keep this thing going is with your help. So if you can support on Patreon every month, that would be great. If you just go to patreon.com slash sleepy time tales, you can sign up there for as little as $2 a month to get early access on the main episodes and $5 a month gets you a whole lot of new bonuses uh, that are very worth, very much worth checking out. Someone who is now taking advantage, hopefully, of those bonuses is Tracy, who signed up recently. Big shout out and a thank you to you, Tracy, for signing up to the Patreon. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful for your support. But it is also difficult to commit to something monthly. Everyone's got subscriptions and constant charges to deal with. So maybe you can make a once-off contribution every now and then. If that's the case, then you can go to the tip jar on the website. It's a little paypal.me link, and you can sign up there. Another shout-out there to Emily, who made a contribution to that. And that is very appreciated. Thank you, Emily. And a reminder as well that I'm now doing podcast editing and production and publication. So if you would like to start a podcast and you don't want to deal with all the technical and boring stuff, or you have a podcast and you're having trouble keeping up to all the technical and boring stuff, give me a shout and I can help you out and make your life a lot easier and help you share your passions with the world. And um, that's enough of that for tonight. Thanks for the time. Let's get back to the show. Return this week to Old Glass and How to Collect It by J. Sidney Lewis. James I was a foreigner to England and English sentiment, and with none of the qualities that win admiration or esteem. He was ungainly, garrulous, vain, pedantic, and above all, cowardly in an age which placed physical courage as the first of human attributes. Even his not inconsiderable intellect failed to compensate for an utter lack of everything else which in his time found worthy of admiration. Charles I was a tyrant, narrow, mean, obstinate and unscrupulous, a man without ability, a king without honour, his death is the one bright spot in a dreary and disastrous record, for nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it. Charles II, gay, witty, insouciant, reckless, had, it may be granted, certain qualities that take the common taste, but he was utterly profligate, entirely without principle. He sold England to France, betrayed Holland, robbed the state and the navy, and starved his sailors to flatter his mistresses. James II was cold, callous, cruel, a sycophant to the strong and a tyrant to the weak. He was a bigot and unscrupulous in his bigotry. He was no less licentious than his brother, though much more of a hypocrite. What was the glamour that made men give their all? House, wealth, lands, and even life itself, to bolster the falling fortunes of an unworthy line, and restore it to the throne from which it had been twice driven by an outraged people. But we are digressing. There is in any case no doubt as to the glamour which surrounds the Jacobite glasses in the eyes of the collector of today. The greater part of these glasses were used in one or other of the various clubs or societies, which sprang up for the purpose of propagating Jacobite principles and furthering the Jacobite cause, which meant, in brief, plotting for the downfall of the House of Hanover, and in a hard-drinking age it was clear that the consultations could not have been carried on without a considerable consumption of strong liquors and a consequent, adequate supply of glasses, the majority of which were probably engraved in some way or other 
distinctive of the occasion. The most famous of such clubs was the Sarkel Club, founded in 1710 by Sir Watkin Wynn. And one of the most interesting of commemorative glasses refers to him. Let no deceit within your glass be found, but glorious Watkins' health go briskly round. The motto of the Sarkel Club is, appears to have been the Latin fiat, may it happen. And this word is generally found engraved on Jacobite glasses, which are in consequence often referred to as fiat glasses. The best of the Jacobite glasses bear the portrait of Bonnie Prince Charlie on the bowl, encircled by a wreath of laurel, flanked on each side by Scotland's emblematic thistle. Others have two roses supporting the laurels. Sometimes there's the Stuart Rose with two buds, a reference perhaps to James II and his two sons. The design, too, not infrequently, includes an oak leaf, a reference to Charles II's escape from the Roundheads after the Battle of Worcester by taking refuge in an oak, while far below the Roundhead Road and hummed a surly hymn. Some also are engraved in addition with a star, the symbol of a hope never realized by the hapless Stuart Lyon. I have sometimes found the portrait of the pretender with oak leaves, thistle and rose, in place of the usual fiat, and the motto, Orientor Ibo. These glasses have usually air-drawn or knopped stems and funnel-shaped bowls. These Jacobite glasses are among the luckiest finds of the collector of Old English glass. And it is needless to say that the greatest care is essential in purchasing anything which purports to be a genuine specimen. Fiat glasses, especially those bearing the portrait of the pretender, are imitated in considerable numbers and generally disposed of through the shops of small country dealers, pawnbrokers, etc., but I have seen specimens, even in the galleries and large shops in London, which are flagrant frauds, a fact which should have been perfectly patent to the vendors, so caveat emptor. Frequently the ordinary tests for the antiquity of the glass are useless, since the piece is itself genuine old glass of the proper period, and only the engraving modern and this is given a spurious appearance of age by rubbing down with sand and earth, and by allowing the lines of the pattern to become filled with dust and dirt. A test that may be found useful is to hold the piece in a strong light, when some part of the engraved portion may be found untouched by the treatment, and bearing in its clearness and sharpness of line, convincing evidence of its recent origin. Of the Jacobite glasses, those dedicated to the old pretender are entirely beyond the hopes of the ordinary collector. A few exist in old country houses, dotted up and down the country and in various museums. One in the British Museum bears the mottos Cognoscunt Meme and Prim Virtutius. Young pretender glasses are naturally much more numerous, and it is probable that specimens may still be found in out-of-the-way places. Special finds of Jacobite glasses are occasionally made, a whole set being discovered in some unexpected hiding place. One such set is the famous Oxburgh Hall find, now to be seen and admired in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Eleven Jacobite glasses in all were discovered, eight of them being fiat glasses. Four of them of a larger size bear the Prince of Wales' feathers on the upper surface of the foot. One is the glass inscribed to Sir Watkin Wynn, previously mentioned, and one is of special significance in that it bears addition to a portrait of the young pretender 
and inscription, unique in the history of Jacobite glass. Charles ye great, ye brave, the just and good, Britannia's prince ye noblest of a blood, thy glorious feats ye world may pro, Britannia's glory and Britain's shame. As poetry, the verse undoubtedly leaves something to be desired. Although as a panegyric, it is fairly comprehensive. That fact will, however, in no wise detract from its unique interest in the eyes of the collector. While the most rabid Jacobite, if such a person still exists, can hardly fail to be satisfied with such a wholesale and wholehearted testimony to the merits of the leader whose cause he had espoused. The luckless prince, whose doom it was to be always remembered over the water. Great, brave, just, good, Britannia's glory and the rest. This was a hero indeed, sans peur de sans peur reproche. Even the legendary Arthur of round table fame could hardly claim more. A critic might suggest that the portrait which appears on the other side of the glass is hardly worthy of these exalted sentiments, though in point of artistic merit it may fitly challenge comparison with the quality of the verse. The Chesselton glasses from another famous Jacobite set. There are two decanters and eleven wine glasses. The glasses are engraved with the rose and two buds, representing presumably James II and the two pretenders, and the cycle club motto, Fiat. In addition, there is an oak leaf. Whether this is an allusion to the famous royal oak of Boscobel, in which Charles II took refuge after Worcester, as previously mentioned, or is merely the distinguishing mark of the English Jacobites, such as the thistle was the badge of their Scottish comrades, is obscure. The decanters are still more interesting, having, in addition to the rose and its two buds, two oak leaves and a compass, the needle of which points to a star apparently rising towards the zenith, probably in hopeful anticipation of the fortunes of the Jacobite cause. Miss Whitmore-Jones, the present owner of Chasselton, claims that these were made at Derby. Glasses thus elaborately inscribed do not exhaust the list of Jacobite glasses. In many cases, the rose emblem appears in the loan, without the incriminating fiat, which would inevitably convict the owner of treason. In other cases, the emblem was hidden from the casual eye by being engraved underneath the foot. The times were perilous ones, and it behoved careful folk to exercise the greatest caution. Hence arose all the system of symbols and catchwords associated with the Jacobite cause. Byron sums up the attitude in the well-known verse. God bless the king, I mean the faith's defender. God bless, no harm in blessing, the pretender. But who pretender is, or who is king? God bless us all, that's quite another thing. It is possible to meet, here and there, with glasses dedicated to the early Georges. But these are few, and, to say the truth, are lacking in the interest that the romantic and tragic history threw over everything associated with the hapless Stuart line. Williamite glasses are more numerous. They, of course, date from the revolution of 1688, where the party feeling on the one side ran as high in favour of Dutch William as it did on the other in favour of the House of Stuart. Many of them were undoubtedly produced in Ireland, the more interesting commemorating the Battle of the Boyne. Some bear the portrait of the king, generally crossing the Boyne on horseback. Such specimens are exceedingly rare. Later ones bear only an inscription, to the immortal memory, or to the immortal memory of the glorious King William, 
with possibly a rosebud. These are, of course, more ordinary, but are still worth collecting, providing the purchaser can assure himself that they have not been specially prepared for his benefit. The phrase above quoted is possibly a reminiscence of the toast given at orange meetings. To the glorious, pious, and immortal memory of the great and good King William, who freed us from Pope and Popery, knavery and slavery, brass money and wooden shoes. Quite a creditable record of achievements. The boot glasses, to which we refer among the freaks, were probably made in large numbers in George III's reign, to testify to the national hatred of Lord Bute, whose punning emblem, the boot, was burnt by the mob in a thousand bonfires. Whether justly or unjustly, history fails to say. But there is no doubt that Bute was hated with a fury almost without precedent, and the king's mother, whose favourite he was, was hated with equal intensity. In 1763 a jackboot and a petticoat were publicly burnt at Temple Bar, and a crowned ass led through the streets by a man in a Scottish plaid. Boot glasses are generally from four and a half to five inches in height. They are often moulded to represent lacings in the front and trimmings at the sides, and were doubtless used for strong waters, cordials and liqueurs. Memorial glasses inscribed with the names of our great seamen are of course numerous. One to Admiral Hawke, inscribed, Success to the British Fleet, and dated 20th November 1759, was evidently made in commemoration of the Battle of Quiberon Bay, in which that great seaman, deliberately ignoring the fighting instructions, flung convention to the winds, and won a startling victory, and freed Britain from the dread of a French invasion. Similar glasses bear the names of Boscawen, Rodney, Anson, Keppel, and Nelson. The Nelson glasses, as may be supposed, are particularly interesting. Some bear the hero's portrait, others are adorned with a representation of his famous flagship, others again were made in commemoration of his death and his burial in St. Paul's Cathedral. One such specimen, described by Mr. Hartshorn, deserves special mention. It is a goblet, more than eight inches in height, on the straight-sided bowl being engraved a representation of the great admiral's funeral car in the shape of a ship. On the stern is the historic name Victory. At the prow stands an emblematic figure of Victory, bearing in one hand a laurel wreath and in the other a branch of the bay. On the canopy of the car is inscribed the word Trafalgar, below it the name Nile. It is stated that the glasses were made for the officers of the victory, each of whom received one in memory of his chief. The ordinary commemoration glasses made at the time of Nelson's funeral and publicly sold as memorials of the event have on the one side a representation of the funeral car, and on the other, encircled by a laurel wreath, the words, In memory of Lord Nelson, January 9th, 1806. The date is that of the public funeral. These glasses were probably made in considerable numbers, but are now very rare. Apart, however, from the funeral glasses, great numbers of pieces must have been inscribed with his name, as a testimony to his popularity, and of the public gratitude for his victories. Miss Wilmer, in her book on early English glass, gives an illustration of a tumbler inscribed with the names of Nelson, Duncan, Howe, and St. Vincent, and the date, 1st of August, 1798, together with various nautical emblems. But as we have said, the manufacture of commemorative glasses was not confined to occasions of national importance. 
nor were such glasses dedicated only to national heroes. Events of very local importance were frequently signaled in this way. This one is inscribed up to Sowery Bridge, 1758, and serves to record certain improvements in the navigation of the Calder River. A golden fleece, which also forms part of the decoration, symbolizes possibly the commercial advantages likely to accrue thereby. Another commemorates the opening of the air to Calder Canal, and bears the inscription, Success to Trade and Navigation. Others bear political cries, like a cider glass, from the Singer Collection. It is characteristically engraved with sprigs of apple blossom and a barrel, presumably of cider. Around the brim is the legend, No Excise, a probable reference to the political agitation which followed the attempt of the Chancellor of Exchequer, Sir Francis Dashwood, in 1763, to impose a duty of no less than four shillings a hogshead on cider. The next glass is from the same collection. It bears a ship engraved upon the bowl, and has thickly twisted opal stem and slightly wasted sides, which give a peculiar charm to its shape. On it are inscribed the words, Success to the Eagle Frigate, John Connell, Commander, which seems to indicate that it was made to commemorate the launch of that vessel. The fine air-twisted goblet, which is the largest in the illustration, belongs to a period somewhere about 1760. The figure depicted is that of Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, then our ally, and at the zenith of his military glory. It was through his aid that Pitt was enabled to win our colonies of India and America on the battlefields of Europe, and the exhortation to keep it up, which appears on the glass was evidently the expression of some British sympathizers' goodwill. Possibly the piece was made to celebrate one of Frederick's victories. The other glass has a small portrait with the inscription Long Live George, Prince of Wales, 1759. It is beautifully engraved, and altogether one of the finest specimens extant. Figure 27 illustrates particularly fine and interesting examples of a tankard, a covered jar, and a grog glass, all excellent of their kind. The tankard on the right of the plate is engraved with fine leaves and bunches of grapes, together with marguerites, and inscribed with the names Joseph and Jane Burroughs, and was probably a marriage or betrothal glass. The goblet with a square base which stands to the left of the plate is very quaint. There is a representation of a sailing craft upon one side, with inscription, The Anne and Bessie, and on the reverse, James Oddie, Bromley. Probably the name of the owner, both of the craft and the goblet, who registered to posterity his pride in the one by means of the other. This glass, I'm informed, was the property of the late A.P. Trapnell, Esquire, a renowned collector of Bristol porcelain, and, though to a lesser degree, of old glass. The covered grog pot or jar in the centre of the group is artistically engraved with roses and festoons, with inscription, Success to the Britannia, Edmund Eccleston, 1774. For the illustrations of several of the above pieces, I am indebted to the courtesy of the late Mr. J. T. Herbert Bailey. Such examples, which cannot fail to interest the lover of art, as well as the collector of antiques, amply testify to the strides which glass manufacture had made in England, and are also useful as indicating the nature of the finds a collector may even yet make in out-of-the-way places provided he will first take the precaution to acquire such knowledge of the characteristics of old glass, 
as will serve to protect him from being deceived by modern reproductions. One does not, for example, expect to find engraving or cutting on early importations from Venice, or that the glasses made in commemoration of various events invariably bear appropriate inscription, by which they may be immediately identified. Sometimes there is a date alone, sometimes a figure or merely initial, and the collector's imagination and historical knowledge as well as his expert acquaintance with the qualities of old glass, are all called into play to determine the date and occasion when the specimen was produced. It need hardly be said that the historical and commemorative glass are very widely imitated. The commonest and most plausible of the various forms of deception adopted being, as elsewhere suggested, to engrave some comparatively valueless specimen of real old glass, with figures exactly imitating the genuine thing, and so giving it a fictitious value. Chapter 5 Bristol and Nail Sea Glass It is a matter of regret that Bristol's ancient fame for making and cutting glass should have so completely disappeared. In the palmy days of its glass industry, it boasted no fewer than fifteen glass houses, and had no rival in the country, either as regards the quantity or the quality of its output. This was in the year 1760. Thirty years later, the first glassmaker appears on the roll of the city's freemen. But seven years previously, we read that a certain townsman, was admitted a freeman of the city upon his undertaking to train a city schoolboy as his apprentice in the art of glass grinding without the usual premium of seven pounds. But as early as 1666 an order was made by the city council to the effect that no stranger or foreigner should presume to open a shop either with or without glass windows under a penalty of five pounds a fact which seems to indicate that, although glass windows may still have been a novelty, there existed facilities for their supply if required. Apart from casual references like these, the history of Bristol glass is entirely obscure. But as the trade returns for the year 1695 show, that the duty on glass for that year amounted to £17,642 and that a drawback allowed on exported glass amounted in the case of Bristol to no less than a sum of 2,976. It was pretty clear that by the time the industry in Bristol had assumed very considerable dimensions. Bristol glass is certainly the most beautiful of all Old English glass, and there is no doubt that many of the fine specimens one sees, both coloured and plain, were actually produced in the factories of that city. The colouring of Bristol glass is exceptionally brilliant, especially its deep blues. The opaque milky white ware, which is most common, is often ribbed with white streaks or ornamented with flowers in colours in gold, or daubed with red, blue and yellow or with one of these colours. It is a matter for great regret that the factories renowned in early times for the beauty and finish of their output did not maintain their existence for a longer period. The exact date at which the famous opaque ware was made is open to considerable doubt, but the year 1760 cannot be very wide of the mark, for reasons to which I have already referred. In any case, the records of the city show that in the year its glass furnaces were in full blast. We find recorded in 1715 a bequest of china and glass, and in a long account of a feast given to commemorate the ascension of Queen Anne, there is included among the expenditure of the corporation an item of six pounds fourteen shillings for glasses. 
At first, glass was extremely costly. The corporation was called upon to pay no less than four pounds, sixteen ounces, for glass to be placed in Mr. Alderman LaRoche's coach, which was broken at the jail delivery. Fine specimens of the glass worker's art fetched extremely high prices. The glass itself was exceedingly brittle and easily broken as compared with other English and Irish glass. It was frequently decorated with enameled colouring, and many specimens are found with finely curved and twisted handles. It was, in my opinion, the object of the Bristol glass houses to imitate white porcelain. And, in support of this idea, we find manufactured in Bristol glass such articles as vases, cups and saucers, plates, mugs and other utensils, usually made from porcelain and earthenware. Of course, the art of manufacturing this opaque white or milky glass was well known abroad. The white glass of Venice, of Orléans and of Barcelona were already famous. The characteristic feature of its manufacture was the large amount of lead and the small quantity of tin employed as ingredients. Quantities together out of proportion to those used in the manufacture of ordinary transparent glass. It is no very difficult task for an enthusiast to find today excellent specimens of Bristol ware. Its characteristic features are an extraordinary fineness in colour and texture, coupled with a delicate taste both in hue and form. The ware too has a peculiar softness to the touch which is quite characteristic, and provides the amateur collector, once he has recognized it, with an excellent test as to the genuineness of the specimen under consideration. The smaller pieces are often beautifully decorated with painted or enameled flowers, made in hair, fern and the like. The illustrations give an excellent idea of the kind of decoration adopted by the master craftsmen of Bristol. The designs found upon Bristol glass were also, now and again, copies of those found on Venetian and French pieces. But generally speaking, the decoration of Bristol glass was entirely English in conception and execution. This is particularly the case where the pieces were made for some special occasion or purpose. As, for example, commemoration of some event of national importance. And I'm going to leave that there. If you'd like to pick up where we're leaving off, or see the pictures that I've mentioned, they are in the original book on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to follow or subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. Good night and sweet dreams.